one of the richest yet least known waters in the world, lies a mere 60 miles from the United States. The Gulf of California, known since the days of Cortes as the Vermilion Sea. Among a host of fishes are huge shoals of red snapper, barracuda and amberjack. A myriad seabirds breed here, among them the very rare Hearman's gull and the equally rare elegant tern. And mainly in the middle of the gulf is a massive population of sea lions. To this great marine wilderness came Anne and Krav Menuhin on a cruise of over 2,000 miles. For months on end, this little fishing boat, the Deachin, was their only home. But it had the most modern equipment, including underwater scooters and even a tiny collapsible aircraft. To film the biggest creatures on Earth was the expedition's aim the grey whale, the whale shark, and biggest and rarest of all, the huge blue whale, the largest animal the world has ever known. From San Diego, the Menuhins set off to the breeding grounds of the grey whale, 400 miles to the south. I always find I'm stretched between two emotions at the start of an expedition. The relief of getting back to sea, mixed with the concerns and doubts of what we would be facing. I had to get my sea legs these first few days. Our boat felt small and vulnerable in the Pacific swells. This was going to be our world for the next few months, and I was slightly intimidated. Our first destination was the lagoon of San Ignacio, one of three salt lagoons on the Baja coast where the whales breed. An aircraft is a valuable tool for any expedition, but they'd always been too expensive. That is, until I decided to try out this powered hang glider. In those first few seconds of flight, I thought I'd made a terrible mistake. Then. Gradually, as I felt I had more control, I began to enjoy it. Below me stretched the treacherous sandbars that marked the outer barrier of the lagoons. God knows how the whales find their way through them. Ahead of me was the beach I'd left, and beside it, the narrow entrance channel for boats. The aircraft was handling beautifully, and I kept her climbing at full throttle. I was high enough now to see the whole lagoon, and after the Pacific seas, it did look an ideal place for the whales to carve and mate. I could even see the shadowy outline of grey whales in the outer lagoon. With my fuel getting low, I dropped the nose and headed back towards the beach, making a low pass over the Deachin first. Landing was not going to be easy. During my flight, the wind had freshened, gusting across the beach, so my landing was crosswind. I dive for the beach and chop the power. As I touch down, my crew grabbed the wings, wires, and anything at hand to hold me down. Of all mammals on Earth, the California grey whale is one of the most primitive, but far from stupid. Indeed, the Japanese indicate its cleverness by calling it the devilfish. By old-time whalers, it was considered the most difficult whale to hunt and the most dangerous, but it was the only whale likely to charge the boat. Nevertheless, hunt it they did, almost to the point of extinction. 
30 years ago, there was little hope of its recovery. Today, however, it seems to be out of danger, thanks to cooperation between whaling nations, which stopped the slaughter. A cooperation sadly lacking for most other whale species. This monster pushes its great barnacle-encrusted head alongside, seeming to sense that the menu in boat presents no danger. Its tiny eye stares up at Anne as she leans over towards it. I had to reach out and touch the whale as it rolled and rubbed along our boat. This was the only way I felt I could maybe communicate. His chin was extremely solid, and for a good reason. Grey whales are bottom feeders, using their chin and lower jaw to push through the muddy bottom while filtering out small crustacea. It was almost like shaking hands as his pectoral fin came alongside. Seeming to respond to Anne's caress, the 40-ton whale lies almost inert, occasionally raising its head to have a look round. Grey whales have been known to sink a boat with one slap of their tail flukes. They've also been known to attack divers who've appeared without warning. But after spending about two hours alongside the Menuhin's boat, this creature seems friendly enough. And after transferring their camera gear to the smaller Zodiac, Krav and Anne prepare to dive. If we were to have any success in filming the whales underwater, we'd have to move very slowly. I thought it best at first to remain as if part of the boat. It worked. Slowly, the huge whale moved towards me. I waited to dive until I saw that Krov was filming and the whales weren't frightened. Ahead of me was a mother and her calf, which couldn't have been more than a month old. As I watched, the calf blew a stream of bubbles. They probably do this to adjust their buoyancy in the lagoon's salty waters. Even though I had poor visibility, nothing could diminish my excitement. Swimming with these giants is one of the great joys of our work. Sadly, in the end they tired of us and swam away. The Menuhins were thrilled to have managed to swim with the whales. Their patience had been rewarded, for they had done what few divers had done before, film grey whales on their breeding grounds. 
It was a highly successful beginning to the expedition, and the first object had been achieved. Now it was time to head south and say goodbye to the grey whales. The Menuhin's next objective was to film the migrant birds and fishes that in about a month's time were due to travel north up the Gulf of California. This leg of the journey took them 300 miles south down the Baja Peninsula, round Cape San Lucas, and then 400 miles north to the Midriff Islands. The Dijin's first anchorage was to be Raza Island, one of the Midriff group a place Krav was keen to visit because in addition to being a breeding ground for huge colonies of seabirds, it contains something of a puzzle. The puzzle of Raza is these cleared amphitheatres and the thousands of carefully constructed stone mounds around them. Were the amphitheatres cleared to build the mounds or were the mounds built to provide amphitheatres? Did this island, which must be unique to draw hundreds of thousands of seabirds, have a special religious significance to an ancient people, or was it the folly of a 19th century stonemason turned guano collector? From Raza, the Dechin threads her way between the midriffs, heading for Guardian Angel Island, which lies furthest north. These deep blue waters are the coldest in the Gulf, and the richest, offering an abundant food supply for the many species of nesting seabirds. Whitened rocks thick with guano give evidence of the huge bird colonies that will soon arrive. And to await their coming, the Dechin anchors in this natural harbor. She's lying in only four fathoms, but a few yards away, the bottom shelves abruptly to thousands of feet, and the Menuhins are eager to explore. We dive surrounded by a broth of life. Millions of tiny zooplankton and fish swarm in the shallow sunlit waters. Like the sheer cliffs surrounding our anchorage, the bottom drops away almost vertically. It was a lucky dive, for one objective was to try and find a rare fish, a golden grouper. And within seconds of reaching a shelf, my lights picked one up. We followed it to its lair. I could just see its head in the crevice. As I got closer, I saw what a truly striking fish it was. It's not known exactly, but perhaps only 1% of this species changes from a normal drab coloration to this brilliant gold. It's not a freak of nature, but as yet we don't understand the reasons. Typical of bottom growths in this region are these Gorgonian corals commonly known as soft corals. The sea fans are another Gorgonian and thrive here in the rich cold waters.
This dive was to be the first of many in the Gulf, for now our journey south to meet the incoming arrivals would begin. Our first search would be for the fin whale, the second largest animal on Earth. Ranging out ahead of the Deachin, Krav and Anne search hopefully for their fin whales and get the surprise of their lives. Instead of the second largest animal, they sight the largest, the blue whale, the biggest animal the world has ever known. Larger than a dinosaur, the blue whale grows to 100 feet in length and weighs upwards of 150 tons. For Krav, this was the chance of a lifetime. Very few people have ever seen a blue whale. The species has seldom been filmed and never underwater. And here was Krav with his camera and diving gear and a blue whale right alongside him. Within a matter of seconds, I went through the two most violent emotions of my entire life. Euphoria as the greatest creature that's ever lived swam slowly in front of my camera. And bitter disappointment as seconds later, my camera jammed. So remarkable is this piece of film that we'll play it back in slow motion and stop it on a close-up of the head and pectoral fins. That this animal should be so rare is a sobering thought. But the most sobering thought of all is that if whaling continues unabated, Krav may not only be the first to film a blue whale underwater, but also the last. On their return to Raza, the Menuhins found that the migrant seabirds have arrived. 90% of the world's population of Hermans gulls nest on Raza, so do the majority of the world's elegant terns. This dependence on a single nesting area renders the species vulnerable to disturbance. Aware of this, the Mexican government have declared the island a sanctuary. Mixed tern colonies of elegant and royal terns are set in the middle of the big amphitheatres, seemingly very tightly packed, but with each pair inside its own well-defined territory. This tight formation helps to defend their eggs and chicks from predation by the bigger gulls, who are always prowling around on the lookout for an easy meal. All over the island, the newly arrived birds are engaged in the annual ritual of courtship, establishing territories, finding a mate, selecting a nest site, gathering material for building a nest. All this is interspersed with continual disputes, arguments with neighbouring birds over territorial boundaries, in which the attitudes of threat and appeasement play an all-important part. Finally, after days of courtship, the pair bond is made final by copulation. And both before and after the bond is complete, the female is continually pestering her partner for a meal.
The amphitheaters are covered with nesting birds, but as we can see, each pair is safely spaced out from its neighbors. The nearby cairns serve as lookout posts for sharp-eyed sentinels. As we continued south in beautiful weather, we suddenly saw this huge fin cleaving the water. In an instant, Anne and I were in the Zodiac, pulling alongside an incredible sea monster. My greatest pleasure is continually discovering new creatures I'd never seen before, and this was no exception. At first, we had no idea just what it was. One thing we were sure of, it was most definitely a shark. The penny dropped as I watched it swim lazily along, mouth agape, bulbous nose breaking the water. It had to be a basking shark, the second largest fish in the sea. This is the kind of opportunity we're always on the lookout for. So with my camera ready, I got set to meet this monster for the first time. It was about 30 feet long and feeding so intently on the thick plankton streaming by that it hardly noticed me at all. Basking shark is something of a misnomer. It isn't basking at all, but cruising steadily along, sieving up the plankton on which its life depends. Basking sharks grow to a length of over 40 feet and up to eight or nine tons in weight. Almost nothing is known about their breeding cycle. During the summer, feeding near the surface, they follow the shoals of plankton around the coast. But where they go in winter is still a mystery. Clinging to the rear of his huge dorsal fin and back are tiny eels, lampreys. The slow, rhythmical movement of its tail gave little idea of the speed it was traveling, and I finally gave up the chase. The island of San Pedro Martia lies in the middle of the gulf, 30 miles west of Baja. The remains of a volcanic peak left when the gulf itself was formed about 10 million years ago. As with the other islands we've seen in the Gulf, the animal populations are indicative of the richness not of the land, but of the sea. Hundreds of sea lions cluster along its broken shoreline, part of the huge sea lion population that the Gulf maintains. The land is too arid to support a population of mammals, apart from rats, but many species of seabirds hunt their living in the food-rich sea and nest on the rocky ledges of the thousand-foot cliffs among them, the two species of booby, in particular, the blue-footed booby, like its cousin, a close relative of the gannet. Looking like ritual obelisks, 60 feet tall, the stems of cardan cactus cover the top of the island. This cactus, found only in western Mexico, can live for 200 years. The cardan forests seem to us to be the most unlikely rookery for any bird especially a large seabird, so we were surprised to find that the forest belonged to the pelicans. It is quite usual to find young birds in every stage of development, from newly born chicks all the way up to fledglings. The pelican's laying season is very irregular. For a meal of half-digested fish, the young bird has to push head and neck down its parent's gully. In another week or so, this young pelican will be foraging for itself. From the dusty heat of the pelican colony, 
Crav and Anne move back towards the cliffs and switch their attention to the sea lions that plunge from sun-baked rocks into the clear blue sea. Each time we dived in the gulf, we were reminded of the prolific life in it. Just above this boulder-strewn bottom was the same living broth we'd seen on our first dive. The one difference was that here in San Pedro Martir, we were escorted by sea lions. The sea lion ballet continues, but for the Manuins, the show is over. Now it is time for them to leave the remote island of San Pedro Martir and start on the next stage of their expedition. With the whaler and the zodiac towing astern, the Dechin heads south. Krav steers out of the cold waters of the Midriff Islands towards the warmer waters surrounding the tip of the Baja Peninsula. His plan is to explore the underwater ledges of the Pulmo Reef, the only coral reef in the entire Gulf of California. Coral reefs are like home for me. The warm water, fish, and even the corals are so familiar. One thing that's different here is the profusion of life. I've never seen so many fish anywhere in the world. My scooter gave me a sense of freedom. I felt more and more like one of the sea creatures. All coral reef, no matter how large, is made up of tiny animals called polyps, which build a limestone shell. Here we can see how successive generations of polyps have built up the reef beginning at the base with the first that settled here perhaps 60 to 100 years ago. Inside the reef, animals like this moray eel can easily find a home and a good position for ambush. This scorpion fish is so confident of the deadly poison in its spines and its camouflage that it hardly moves even when I touch it.
As I glided over the reefs, I saw this huge house-like object in the distance. Dropping down on it, I saw it was a massive coral colony. Why this particular coral had adopted these shapes, I don't know. It must be to cope with the local conditions. The inside was hollow and I could see straight through to a school of fish on the other side. There was only one inhabitant, a guitar fish, momentarily confused by my light. These are strange fish, being neither ray nor shark, but somewhere between. From now on, we would be spending more and more time at sea, so Anne and I took an opportunity to pass a quiet evening on shore. Evenings were a special time, for we always had a show on our doorstep. It was then that the pelicans would feed on the schools of anchovy pushed to the surface by the large predators. The pelican has two feeding strategies, to plunge dive from about 30 feet and to scoop from a swimming position. In both of these methods, the bird uses the huge bill pouch, which can be expanded to hold up to three and a half gallons, a pretty sizable fish trap. It seems a miracle that pelicans have evolved the way they have. They look so ungainly and fragile, it's hard to believe they can survive the repeated impact of their dives. A pelican weighs up to eight pounds with a wingspan of seven and a half feet. It has inflatable air pockets under the skin for buoyancy, so that after diving it quickly regains the surface. And most important, it has a large degree of binocular vision, essential for judging height, so that when plunge diving, the bird knows the exact moment to fold back its wings. This is timed to a split second just before the bird hits the water, as we can see in freeze frame. And here it is again at natural speed. The Menuhins decide to concentrate on the region around the end of the Baja Peninsula. Their first quest is far from easy, to locate the tip of a sunken mountain only a hundred yards across. In such a vast area, this is like trying to find the proverbial needle. The diving is likely to be okay. deep, to over 200 feet, so Krav and Anne make careful preparation of their gear. Okay, when I get on the platform, hand me the camera. Right. Remembering his ill fortune when filming the blue whale, and not knowing what strange creatures he might meet in these waters, Krav has taken the precaution of mounting a stills camera on top of his cine camera. I felt a bit apprehensive about this dive. All I knew was that somewhere below me in the murk was a mountaintop. On the way down, 
we swam through this huge school of red snapper. These are usually deep water fish. The only thing I could think of was that they were involved in some mating ritual. Our mountain top was a small plateau strewn with gigantic boulders. Down here, the water was as cold as it had been 400 miles north in the midriff, so we were not surprised to find many of the same animals. Large amberjacks circled continuously. I wasn't surprised to find a net caught on part of this peak. Even though it's useless to the fishermen who lost it, we had to be careful, for it could still trap a diver. Just beyond Anne, I saw what must be the highest point and swam towards it. It was the peak we'd been looking for. It's a funny feeling, sitting on top of a mountain, 150 feet underwater. As the amberjack continued circling, I became more and more anxious about shark. Throughout the dive, I'd been aware of their large shapes out at the limit of my vision. Like deadly ephemeral zeppelins, more an illusion than a reality. When I finally did see one, I didn't know who was more surprised, the hammerhead or me. Our time at this depth was limited, and soon we had to head back to the surface with a short stop for decompression, the price paid for deep dives. As I swam back towards the boat, I came across a school of tiny squat lobsters. These pugnacious creatures make up part of the diet of whales and whale sharks. Returning to their anchorage, the Menuins pass a Mexican purse seiner hauling her net. This boat is fishing for tuna, but has encircled a school of dolphins. This is not unusual, since tuna and dolphin hunt similar food and are frequently found together. It is said that many thousands of dolphins die each year in the nets of tuna boats. So, anxious to see what will happen to this school of dolphins when the net is brought aboard, the Menuins heave to, waiting. These chase boats are normally used for herding tuna in a compact group while the net is shot around them. But here they are being used on humanitarian grounds, for the Mexican skipper is trying to save the dolphins. He goes astern to elongate the net, which enables the chase boats to drive the dolphins into the cod end. Now a panel in the net is dropped and the dolphins are free. Once the dolphins are clear of the net, the catch can be brought aboard. But instead of the expected tuna, writhing and slashing in the net are 20 or 30 requiem sharks. That these man-eaters have been taken from waters where Crav and Anne have just been swimming is a frightening thought. Not only that, but these are the waters they'll be diving in on their final quest. The search for the largest fish alive, the whale shark. 
Aboard the Deachin, using an admiralty chart, Krov points out to his skipper, Keith Beaton, the search area where he thinks the whale sharks are most likely to be found. This is a shelf running parallel with the shore where the bottom rises steeply a mile or two off the tip of the peninsula. Ocean currents striking this shelf cause an upwelling of nutrients which discolour the surface and can be seen from the air. So, to find this, the first job is to get airborne. This was our first flight with a set of floats we'd fitted to the aircraft. But not having enough material to make them large and buoyant enough for normal use, we had to mount the whole assembly on the Zodiac for takeoff. I planned to land in the shallow surf. The floats were for emergencies only, to stop me from sinking completely. purposely not mounted a camera on this first flight with the floats, and as it turned out, with good reason. From up here, I could see the line of discolored water where I felt the whale sharks would be feeding. It looked an easy task to follow it in the Zodiac. This aircraft is controlled by body movement alone, lean forward to go down and back to go up. Suddenly my engine quit. I had no altitude. I had to dive to get speed and turn into wind simultaneously. I leaned back to flare for touchdown, but the floats, designed for emergency, couldn't support me upright we started to sink. I released the harness and made my way out as Anne brought our whaler in at speed. I was so intent on getting clear that I didn't even think of all the sharks we'd seen on the day before. I was so relieved to see Krov was safe and not tangled in the maze of wires. We'd temporarily lost the aircraft, but the flight was not a total write-off. At least I had pinpointed the whale shark search area. Krav's theory proves absolutely right. As they cruise slowly along the line of murky water above the coastal shelf, a huge mottled shadow suddenly appears beneath the zodiac. This must be it. Anne goes overboard at once, and Krav follows her down. And there it is. This is the biggest living fish. Relatively harmless to divers because it's a plankton feeder, although it has numerous small teeth, in fact, 310 rows of them in each jaw. The skin is nine inches thick, the toughest of any animal. It can grow to a length of 70 feet with a total weight of about 70 tons. This fish, which like many big fish has a cluster of remoras under its belly, is a 50 footer of 20 or 30 tons. Until 1828, when some intrepid African fisherman happened to harpoon one, the whale shark was a phantom, the subject of sea monster legend. Never having been examined by a man of science, it was quite simply unbelievable. size underwater is something I never get used to. But as I swam close to this creature, there was something else. It was unmistakably a shark. Slowly, my fear gave way to a feeling of wonder.
there was a conspicuous bulge around her ventral area. She may have been pregnant. It's not even known if the young are born alive or in egg cases. Every few minutes, or perhaps when she tired of our attentions, she'd roll over into a vertical dive, disappearing into the blackness. If we were patient, she'd come up again in about the same area. I'd run out of air when she returned, but not wanting to miss a moment in the water with her, I free-dived. This, I knew, would be my last dive, for our time was up and we had to leave the gulf. Our expedition was over, and we both felt so lucky to have seen and done so much. We were far richer for the experience, with a wealth that cannot be reckoned in any terms other than awe and wonder. These majestic rocks of Cape San Lucas mark the entrance to a wilderness Anne and I would never forget, a sea full of wondrous beasts and giants.